Hello, welcome. We're excited to have you here for the sixth session of the Triton Talks webinar series. Today we will be hearing about the Triton Initiative's Environmental Monitoring Field Trials Research from Joe Haxel and Alicia Amerson from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and Morgan Pattison from Solid State Lighting Services. Joe will be diving into his underwater noise field trials conducted at multiple marine energy sites, and Alicia and Morgan will be discussing their research on anthropogenic light associated with marine energy systems. Before we dive in, I have a few logistical notes for our attendees. We are using a Zoom webinar setup and have muted you to ensure there are no interruptions during the presentation. If you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, please put them in the chat and I will read them during our joint Q&A session after our presenters give their talks. We'll also be including helpful links to resources and publications in the chat throughout the webinar, so keep your eye out for those. We are recording this webinar and will later post the recorded video on YouTube in our Triton Talks playlist. If you'd like to reference it later, share it with others or view a webinar that you missed. And we will make sure that that's in the chat for you. So now it is time to meet the presenters. We will have each presenter introduce themselves, starting with Joe Haxel. So take it away, Joe. And thank you all again for your patience. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Kayleen, Rachel. Um, I'm Joe Haxel. I am a marine scientist here at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Squim, Washington. Um, I am also the principal investigator of the Triton Initiative that we're sharing um, information from here today. My background is in ocean acoustics. Um, I came to the lab about two years ago, and um, my focus has really been on sort of this underwater noise topic related to anthropogenic disturbance potential anthropogenic disturbance around um, marine energy converters. So that I'll pass it on to Alicia. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And thanks, Kayleen and Rachel and everyone that's attending today. Thank you uh, for attending. I'm Alicia Emerson. I'm the ecosystem science team lead for the biological science division at PNNL. And inside the Triton Initiative, I lead several tasks researching large whale and seabird response to marine energy stressors. I'm a marine biologist certified PMP with a curiosity in exploring boundaries where human dimension and wildlife and wild places merge together. And especially as it relates to marine and coastal environments and marine energy systems. And now I'd like to pass it over to Morgan. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Morgan Pattison. I'm a lighting scientist uh, with a background in LED lighting technology and research. Um, I'm a consultant and I'm consulting on this program. And I also consult with the Department of Energy, uh, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Program on energy saving lighting technology and with the National Park Service on uh, the general topic of ecological impacts of light. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. Now we will pass the mic back to Joe to discuss his work on the Triton Field Trials Underwater Noise Research. Okay. Thanks, Kayleen. So hello, everybody, again, and thanks for joining today. Um, as Kayleen said, I'm going to share some results and um, takeaways from two recent studies that we performed as part of the Triton Initiative Triton Field Trials, or TFIT, as we refer to it. Um, and in these projects, we used, uh, in one of them, we used a drifting hydrophone to measure and quantify sound levels around an operational tidal turbine. And then in the other study, we used a set of stationary uh, commercial off-the-shelf hydrophones to record uh, longer-term underwater noise around a wave energy converter, or WEC, as we refer to them, off the coast of Southern California in La Jolla at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. But before I begin, um, I want to take a minute and recognize some of my colleagues from PNNL, uh, namely Jiaxin Zhang, Garrett Staines, Jason Martinez, Daniel Dang, and James McVeigh, um, shown in the lower right here, who are critical to the, the, to the success of these, uh, these efforts. So let's get started with a little background on why we need to pay attention to underwater noise emissions around tidal turbines and wave energy converters. Um, because of the efficient propagation of acoustic energy underwater, 
marine mammals, fish, and invertebrates um, are sensitive to acoustic conditions and rely on sound for critical life functions, such as foraging, communication, navigation, and prey avoidance, to name a few. The importance of the acoustic environment for many species is a key concern for maintaining health, healthy coastal ecosystems. And the introduction of marine energy converters into these areas has raised concerns for regulators partially stemming from the uncertainties surrounding underwater noise emissions. So a few examples to draw from, from um, there are knowledge gaps remaining on the effective frequencies and the potential for acoustic disturbance for animals in these habitats. Next slide, please. So fortunately, some headway has been made with regards to a standardized technical approach for characterizing underwater noise of, of marine energy converters. Um, with a 2019 release of an International Electrotechnical Commission or IEC specification, shown here the 62600-40 that we are referring to as the dash 40 these days. Um, and this document provides technical guidance for standardized hydrophone and data acquisition equipment, data collection methodology, and analysis and reporting for acoustic measurements. But it hasn't been fully put to practice yet in the US due to a lack of marine energy device deployments. So the spirit of the Dash 40 technical specification promotes transferability of the results from acoustic studies to other sites and different types of devices to fill knowledge gaps around underwater noise emissions and help provide the information that can be used to inform models for underwater noise at future marine energy deployments. Next slide, please. In July of 2021, last year, um, we worked with, with colleagues at the University of New Hampshire's Living Bridge Project putting the IEC-40 technical spe specification guidance for acoustic measurements to practice around an operating tidal turbine. The UNH turbine is part of the Living Bridge Project located at the Memorial Bridge that spans the Piscataqua River tidal estuary. Um, the more, Memorial Bridge is a motor bridge that's connecting the states of New Hampshire and Maine. The UNH turbine is a four bladed new energy corporation Envirogen 25 kilowatt rated vertical axis cross flow turbine design. That's a mouthful. <laughs> mounted on a, it's mounted on a floating turbine deployment platform. Um, and that platform is fixed to the bridge pier nearest the Portsmouth, New Hampshire side of the bridge. You can see there in the, the top two, two pictures. The turbine is 3.2 meters in diameter with a 1.7 meter rotor height. And the energy conversion system um, and PTO or power electronics are housed above water on the turbine deployment platform. And um, you'll see later on in the presentation why that's an important thing to note. Next slide, please. So the site experiences mixed semi-diurnal tides with asymmetry in the flow velocities where the stronger ebb tides are, are better able to generate power. Um, and here in this figure, we're showing the turbine capacity rating as normalized by the maximum power during a 24 hour period on a particular day where we were doing our acoustic measurements, July 23rd. So this is a deviation from the full 25 kilowatt power capacity rating of the, of the turbine. Um, since that full 25 kilowatts was not reached uh, during the dinner, during our time of the acoustic study. The colored groups indicate uh, the normalized measured power capacity rating bins that are used to calculate the sound level metrics within the particular measurement zones that we'll describe later. Um, and the acoustic survey was, the effort was carried out during daylight hours um, during the second ebb tidal exchange sequence on the right. In the, period where we were making our recordings, there's a gap in the, um, the power generation bins. And that is where we actually braked the turbine. So meaning we actually stopped the turbine from um, generating power, stopped the blade rotation to make measurements um, basically of a zero power generation capacity at that point for comparison against when it was operating at higher capacity. So just want to make that point. 
Okay, next slide. So as per the, the IEC-40 um, guidance, we used a drifting hydrophone approach to mitigate and reduce flow noise contamination. That can be a significant problem for acoustic measurements in these high current environments. And on the top side of our system, the drifting hydrophone uh, consisted of a half meter diameter closed cell foam buoy. And we mounted a, a GPS receiver and antenna um, and a watertight housing on that. Shock cord below that system to a static line were used to suspend the hydrophone at a target depth of 1.6 meters below the surface. And that aligned the hydrophone sensor near, near the middle of the turbine rotor swept area. Um, we used an Ocean Sonics IC Listen hydrophone, a commercial off the shelf system. Um, and we, we put that into a ballasted housing and with a custom flow shield um, that was built around the hydrophone to uh, isolate it from turbulence. And um, that flow shield was modeled after the University of Washington's DAISY hydrophone. Um, and, and like I mentioned, that was used to reduce the low frequency noise contamination from the turbulence around the sensor. Okay, next slide, please. So a typical hydrophone drift sequence is shown here, moving left to right and numbered one through six. The deployment vessel moved into position in an upstream area of the measurement zones and held station until no vessels were observed within the site. Um, in the upper left, the drifting hydrophone was deployed and drifted freely in the current towards and alongside the turbine shown in images two and three. And the engines of support of uh, our vessel, the supporting vessel, were turned off after the deployment, along with any other noise producing electronics or devices. And as the buoy drifted beyond the turbine platform to an estimated distance beyond the downstream measurement zone, um, the support vessel engines were turned back on. And we recovered the buoy quickly uh, before it uh, became fouled on a downstream reef that was just, just downstream of the turbine. So this sequence was, report was, was repeated 14 times throughout the ebb tidal cycle um, during that day. Next slide, please. So here's a map showing the site logistics with the Memorial Bridge spanning the river and the Living Bridge turbine shown as the white circle with the black dot um, that's on the bridge piling there. The ebb flow moves from west to east or light, uh, or from left to right in this picture. Um, the IEC-40 technical specification calls out four distinct measurement zones for calculation of noise metrics surrounding the energy converter. Um, upstream, downstream, port, and starboard. The site configuration made the starboard zone measurements impossible due to the acoustic shadowing from the bridge pier. Um, and the port zone had to be moved inward toward the turbine to a center zone distance of 25 meters um, due to the physical width limitations of the tidal channel. The upstream and downstream zones maintained a distance of 100 meters from the turbine, um, but these needed to be slightly offset to the port side um, to avoid collision of the hydrophone um, with the turbine as it was flowing through that, the measurement area. So here we are showing the color-coded sound pressure levels from 14 discrete drifts um, from the hydrophone as, as it was carried past the turbine during the, those 14 measurement sequences. The 25 meter by 25 meter measurement zones are shown here as the white boxes. And fortunately, um, a passing thunderstorm reduced vessel traffic in the area during the recordings. Um, after the storm passed, we were able to go out and, and collect uh, all those, uh, most of those 14 measurement sequence without vessel noise. Um, and that was a significant issue um, because this is a very, very busy port area. So it was really hard to find times when there weren't boats working. We were actually there over several days and we just got lucky during this thunderstorm period um, where there wasn't vessel traffic and could go out and make our measurements. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of the data. The top figure shows a spectral time series as a function of distance from the turbine 
So along the uh, the x axis is actual distance from the turbine, and and it's a little hard to see, maybe small, but you can see that the the numbers increase, or the, sorry, the numbers decrease as you move along the axis, and then um, actually go negative. And so that's um, the hydrophone as it was passing passing the turbine. Um, the y axis is the is the frequencies. Um, and the upstream direction is to the left and the downstream direction is to the right in the figure. The colors represent the received acoustic energy levels with the hotter colors representative of louder sounds. Um, and as you can see, there isn't a lot of variation in energy across the frequencies um, and no distinct recognizable acoustic signature as the hydrophones were drifting closer to the turbine. The middle figure shows the integrated sound pressure level during the same drift um, and also shows you there was very little variation um, as it approached the turbine, the smaller numbers along the x-axis. And the bottom panel shows the turbine power generation series um, during that particular drift, also with no obvious correlated changes in underwater sound levels. Next slide, please. So here are the decade acoustic spectral levels within the measurement zones as a function of the normalized turbine power capacity ratings. So those colored bins I showed you earlier. Um, and unfortunately, we were not able to get data at the 75% or 100% power ratings um, for the turbine as those levels occurred during the earlier tidal sequence, which was in the early dark morning hours where we weren't, we weren't taking measurements. Um, and the spectral noise level curves here remain steady with measurement zone, within the measurement zones, despite the increasing power capacity of the turbine from zero to 50%. Um, and additionally, there's no obvious difference in the levels between the zones. Um, and this all indicates that there was a lack of a, of, a, of a strong measurable acoustic signal from the turbine at these power ranges or power generation states. In the paper, um, in the, that's in a special issue that we referred to, we did a, um, a pairwise statistical comparison between these different decade curves um, using a, a man weight EU test. Um, and it showed that there was no significant difference between these, these measurements, whether in the zones or at the different power ratings. Okay, next slide, please. So to summarize our, our efforts and recommendations here from the UNH Living Bridge measurements, um, the IACE-40 technical specification provides good guidance for instrumentation, data collection methods, um, and analysis and reporting of the measurements for the characterization of, of acoustic emissions. It's a really good place um, to sort of build the framework for measuring and characterizing marine energy converters but still some modifications to this uh, specification, sample design and, and data collection approach might be necessary on a site-by-site -site basis to provide the most meaningful revolt results. Um, as we found during this busy time of year in Portsmouth, maintaining as much flexibility and sampling um, as is possible is really key for successful recordings and being able to record during night hours um, could be could be the way to improve that um, data quality and the measurement and would allow for coverage at, at, at a lot of different distances and flows and, and avoid those challenges of, of all the nearby vessel traffic. So um, this study provides a valuable data point for tidal turbine acoustic emission measurements for regulators and also serves as sort of a early use case for the Dash 40 technical specification. Um, the underwater acoustic emissions from the turbine couldn't be detected um, above the ambient levels in the area under these conditions. And the placement of the power conversion components and electronics above the water on the turbine deployment path, platform um, most certainly also aided in reducing any kind of turbine related underwater noise. Okay, next slide. Uh, so before moving on, I want to thank our collaborators at UNH, Martin Wozniak, Patrick O'Byrne, Mason Bionicic, and John Hunt, as well as Brian Pelagi and Corey Crisp of the University of Washington um, for field support, um, discussions, and contributions as we, as we did the field work and worked through the study. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, now switching environments. Um, I want to share with you some of the underwater noise work we're, we're doing in the open ocean around a wave energy converter demonstration. Um, we've established a collaboration with CalWAVE and partner with Scripps Institution of Oceanography, um, to, again, to, to apply the Dash 40 guidelines for character, characterizing the acoustic emissions from CalWAVE's X-Wave device shown here um, in a demonstration off the, the Scripps Pier in La Jolla, California. At the beginning of the year in February, we deployed three fixed hydrophones um, at the IEC-40 prescribed distances of 100 and 200 meters from the X-Wave device. Um, and those were to record long, the longer term sound emissions over several months um, and with the survey being aligned with a level A characterization in the Dash 40 technical specification. So this would give us information of the, the acoustic emissions of the WEC through a range of, of environmental conditions. The hydrophones were successfully recovered in May and all of the sensors recorded um, as they were programmed and analysis of that six terabytes of data that we collected is, is underway now. Next slide, please. So uh, for this, we used three Soundtrap 600 hydrophones from Ocean Instruments. Um, those were recording at 196 kilohertz on a 50% duty cycle, and they were deployed in 20 meter water depths around the X-Wave WEC at Scripps. Um, and in this photo here, you can see a Scripps diver near one of the hydrophone stations. They were doing regular checkout and maintenance dives of the landers to make sure nothing was fouled um, and that they were still uh, positioned in the areas that we, we put them down. The hydrophone is mounted in the middle of the lander unit um, and the sensor is set at one meter above the seafloor as prescribed in the Dash 40. Um, an acoustic release pop-up recovery buoy is mounted on the side you can see there. And um, the acoustic release was used to accurately survey the geolocation position in from the of the lander frame from the surface. Um, initial looks at the data uh, look pretty good. Um, it's clean nice clean data and we're actually uh, see uh, starting to be able to see some very faint signals that um, we're, we're attributing to the wet, but we're working with CalWave to um, correlate when we're seeing signals from the WEC and what those sort of look like with what their WEC operations were. So we're looking forward to sharing these results um, in upcoming Triton updates. We, we've just, we're just diving into the data and getting some of the analysis done. Six terabytes of data is a lot of data to handle. So we're, we're, uh, we're struggling a little bit with that, but but definitely making good headway. Um, so thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about either of these studies and the work we've done here at the at the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you so much, Joe, for that wonderful talk and information about your underwater noise studies. Um, now we'll be switching gears, and we'll pass it off to Alicia and Morgan to discuss Triton's anthropogenic light research. For those of you who asked wonderful questions throughout Joe's presentation, I have compiled them all and we will make sure we get to them at the end. All right, I'll pass it off to Alicia and Morgan. Thank you, Kayleen. <laughs> um, I appreciate the introduction. Um, so, Morgan and I will be talking about anthropogenic light today. And anthropogenic light is light that's made by man. So it's human-made light. And here you can see uh, lights glowing across the US and Central America at night from space. And the other photos demonstrate sky glow from cities at night. So we are starting to light up the night sky with um, the amount of human-made light across the globe. Most animals depend upon nighttime or dark conditions for sustaining life. And it's important to understand their biological responses to light to inform and develop recommendations to reduce impacts to wildlife and their environment while we're making plans to deploy marine energy devices in rivers, wetlands, um, and pelagic environments. So within a regulatory and within the regulatory and, and industry, Marine energy lighting hasn't been a major topic of discussion, although in recent years, 
there's been major lighting advancements and regulatory agencies have taken notice of this and the importance to look at the circadian rhythms or changes in behaviors of animals dependent upon dark conditions for um, living. So we wanted to learn more about these advancements in lighting and how they were being applied to the marine energy, envi marine energy devices and in the marine um, environment. And so we wanted to review the current state of knowledge on impacts to wildlife from different lat lighting strategies and in at sea and coastal environments. So after collecting this information, we wanted to apply this to marine energy as a way to suggest recommendations to minimize or reduce ecological impacts um, that lighting associated with marine energy devices may have in the environments where they'll be deployed. So try to get ahead of this is, was our, is our goal. And the Triton team um, partnered with Solid State Lighting Solutions owned by Morgan. And with his expertise in lighting, and environmental impacts, we conducted this research together. I also want to thank and recognize our lead author, Caroline Riley, and our co-authors, Julia Larson, Garrett Staines, and Joe Haxel. And Solid State Lighting does a lot of work with DOE, as um, Morgan mentioned, in regards to LED technology and energy saving, and works with the National Park Service to develop preservation lighting practices in parks. And so this was such a great pairing for Triton um, to learn more about lighting. So next slide, please. So what we conducted a high level review of different species from primary producers, so plants and zooplankton to marine mammals and sea turtles. And our findings what we found is that wildlife can have different responses to light, which can also vary depending on the type of light that's produced. So some species may be photo positive or attracted to lighting or light and others can be photo negative and repelled by light. Other responses to light include disorientation, changes, to fit, changes in fitness level or alterations in predation, circadian rhythms might be disrupted, increase in stress or physiology might occur. So these responses can vary for organisms that seem apparently similar. So such as species of crustaceans, zooplankton, commercial fish, bats, or coral. And different life stages of the same species can also show varied responses to light, including their vision. So this affects, these effects can lead to demographic changes within an ecosystem affected by unnatural light or this anthropogenic light. So I'll provide some examples of our findings for the different categories of species. And you'll, you'll see there's some commonalities um, in the food chain. And I'm gonna start with the lowest or the, the primary producers. So they use light for energy. So this would be plants and um, zooplankton. The primary producers photosynthesize during dark times of the day this could change or photosynthesize energy during light times of the day and need rest during dark times of the day. And if it's constantly light, this could change the rest of the ecosystem because potentially there's biomass and species distribution changes from the primary producers um, due to this excess of photosynthesis um, during the dark hours. Larvae and plankton are the next species that we looked at, and there are many studies on the dial movement of zooplankton or photosynthetic plankton and their role in the food chain. These plankton are abundant and provide nutrients for many marine animals. They're triggered by light levels. Any changes in their behavior may trigger behavioral changes in other animals. So for instance, this could impact Dungeness crab larvae behavior a major commercial industry that is found around the PacWave marine energy test site. So at PacWave, zooplankton and larvae identified, it, identified in the permitting process will give insight on which species potentially could be monitored um, and additional studies around anthropogenic light and marine energy. We also looked at fish and fishing boats use high intensity lights to catch fish. So this is not, the, and they've been doing this a long time. So this is nothing new um, as far as response, but we found that in a light, in a lab study with, um, with fish that 
at night, they can grow bigger and heavier when there's light. And they also die earlier um, and can experience more predation because of additional lighting at night. So more broadly, studies of lighting effects on larger set of fish species might assist our understanding and trends in what causes behaviors to different types of species and um, predicting how they might respond to light um, associated to marine energy devices. And seabirds and bats are of concern um, in many areas around coastal environments. And anthropogenic light can inhibit um, birds' use of visual cues, and such as magnetic ones that are migrating. Um, tailoring the light spectrum or using flashlights may um, have promoted the means of minimizing light impacts on birds. Um, marine energy devices may cover small areas and their impact on migratory wildlife passing through an area can effectively increase the ecological effects. Special considerations um, should be given to turning off maintenance lights during migratory times of year. So if there's not a light that's needed, potentially turning that off. And in regards to migratory bats, um, terrestrial studies of bats have indicated species dependent on light responses. So including some bats, particularly avoiding light, lighted areas, and our findings for marine mammals and sea turtles, there's a number of marine mammals and reptiles that can be affected either directly or indirectly by offshore lighting. And these consist both of migratory and non-migratory species of whales, dolphins, sea lions, otters, seals, and sea turtles. A significant concern is changing in their feeding behavior, feeding habits, and the ability for energy acquisition. So this could be, affected an indirect influence, such as a difference in prey location due to the lighting, um, abundance or direct influence on the, um, also on the abundance of prey, so where the prey is located, and their ability to actually capture the prey in that location and based on the abundance. So seals have been observed to use anthropogenic light to assist in visual hunting at nighttime. So this is a benefit for seals when there's additional lighting. Minimizing light levels in the water should decrease this behavior and further studies informing spectral effects on predation behavior in marine mammals could further alleviate any problems that these animals might encounter um, in the marine environment around marine energy devices. And now I'll pass this over to Morgan. All right, next, next slide, please. So, you know, as Alicia mentioned, we see, we want to think about um, what the ecological and wildlife impacts of lights are and could be with, you know, with these marine en energy installations. And this, this is a, um, an understanding that's developing in parallel with some broader concerns with the amount of light we're using in our environment. And, and do we really need to have this much light out there? And over, overlaying that with new, new technology that's, that's coming into play. We're all pretty familiar with LED lighting by now. And, and LED lighting doesn't just save energy, but it offers some new features. And, and so how do, we, how do we leverage those new features and new understanding at, you know, of, of the impacts and get ahead of, of what the what the lightscape changes from marine energy devices, is you know the impacts they might have on wildlife so just put a few pictures here um of course you know you can the light from from shore affects wildlife you know we know this in, in coastal regions with turtles and and uh you know with coral and some study some research and fish uh and you know oil rigs if, if you go to santa barbara they're pretty pretty well lit with light going everywhere and, and windmills and and then there's navigation aids buoys and then um, you know ships and and of course like Alicia mentioned uh, fishing boats and and uh, in the bottom right that image just shows a, a light dome out in the Channel Islands off Santa Barbara of, of squid boats squid fishing with really high intensity lights this is seven miles away uh, where we took this image and the middle the middle uh, picture shows an actual squid boat with the lights uh, kind of hanging off the top. In the in the bottom left, 
is a little bit of an exotic use of light or, or example of light impacts. Um, that's in Hawaii on the big island where they have, uh, they, they put out lights for recreational pur purposes to attract uh, fish and plankton so that divers and scuba divers can, can see the wildlife, particularly the manta rays. So in, in that whole, there's a whole little uh, tourist industry there and, and that came about uh, because lights were shining from a construction site of a hotel right on the water and the manta rays started congregating there. So we, we know that lights have an impact. We know they, they alter the ecosystem. And the, the, you know, the question is, how can we use the new technology and, and improved understanding to minimize the kind of the lighting footprint? Um, next slide, please. So there, there are existing standards for lights in the marine environment. And they're, they're really around safety and navigation and they're not taking into account um, ecological impacts or really taking into account the capabilities of the new technology. So we wanna make sure that we, in, in our you know, understanding or, or research to, to understand better the implications of, of lighting and these, these green energy situations that we're not degrading the safety or, or purpose of the lights, but rather achieving the purpose of, of the lights while also taking into account uh, ways to mitigate their impacts on, on the ecology. So this is just making sure that we're covering all the bases and not going backwards on safety or human function. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a little, um, a few points about LED technology. Uh, there's, there's features of LED technology that influence how, how they can and should be deployed and, and their impacts on, on the local wildlife. And, and the, first, the first feature of LED technology is that you can really make lights of any color. And that's something new that wasn't quite as readily achieved with old lighting technologies, previous lighting technologies. Uh, but it's, you know, there's certainly some efficiency and implications with different colors, but you know, you really can make light of any color or combination of colors that you want with LED technology. And that's a brand new uh, capability that's not been fully, um, fully used yet. And, or we don't, we don't even know how to use that yet, I would say. Um, also, you know, LEDs as, as kind of small discrete sources, can be highly directional. Uh, they are already uh, they're, you know, they, they only emit out one side, but they're also, because they're small size, you can apply optics and put light just where, where it needs to be. You don't need to have it going everywhere. And that's a pretty big difference with LED technology compared to previous technologies. So we have, you know, color and directionality, and then also LEDs, you know, they don't have any delayed on or off time. Uh, they're you know totally controllable and dimmable. And they can be pulsed at any frequency, and also you know LEDs are kind of these discrete sources, so they can be you can use as many LEDs as you need to to achieve any intensity level you need. With, with previous lighting technologies, uh, it, with some of the technologies, it could be hard to provide less light uh, than than the source uh, put out there. Right? It's hard to dim. Uh, high intensity discharge sources. So um, LEDs just give you much more flexibility um, to do the right thing in the application once we know what the right thing is. And that's, that's the question mark. That's where this animal research comes in and, and the best practices, you know, connecting the use of the new technology with what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to avoid. Uh, next slide, please. I mean, so, so even, even at our kind of basic or early understanding of animal impacts on wildlife, there's a lot we can do better with lighting to reduce the impacts of, of, of light in the environment. And, and, you know, the top panel here just shows that you really just want to use the amount of light necessary, not, not too much light. There's, you know, I think 
We have a history of overlighting things at night, uh, which is actually can be counterproductive because we're really looking for um, contrast, light level contrasts at night. You know, we're very, very, as people, we're very sensitive to light level contrasts. So more light tends to actually degrade our night vision and, and reduce our capability to, to see at night and to perceive contrasting light levels. So, you know, just this is from, from our paper on the, on the light lighting um, of wax in that journal special edition uh, um, article. Anyways, um, so just A versus B, you know, A has light splashing all over the, the buoy and, and going up, going upward and, you know, hitting the water where it really doesn't, doesn't do any good. It only is only detrimental light. Up, up light and light away from the buoy hitting the water is only, it's wasted energy and, and it's detrimental to the ecology. So B shows kind of an idealized situation where the light's going out more horizontally for, as, a, as a navigation aid, and that's the only place it needs to be. So that's, you know, this is a feature of the new technology that we can get this directionality much better. And the lower panel um, just shows an example of, uh, of a cartoon from, uh, I think, Fort Collins, um, where they, you know, they, they care about their night sky there in Colorado. And, you know, we, we all have seen roadway lights that look like, like all of these. Um, you know, the, the one on the bottom left, the light emitting in all directions, all of that up light is accomplishing nothing. It, it doesn't help the situation at all. It just goes into the environment. Our satellites can see it, but it's not achieving any lighting purpose. And, and so as we go from that kind of old fashioned light on the left to really the, the best case light on the right where the, where the light's just hitting the target area and it's just doing its, its illumination job and, and you know not hitting pedestrians right in the eye directly and causing glare. Um, that's, you know, that's the mindset we need to start having with all of all of our lighting installations. Uh, next slide. So that that guidance kind of inferred from those those images is actually starting to be codified. Um, uh, you know, in the paper we we talked about best practices and, and the best practices we came up with don't diverge from uh, the best practices from the Illuminating Engineering Society, the International Dark Sky Association, and the National Park Service. It's all, you know, people have been thinking about, you know, what needs to change with light at night. And the, the first thing is, is, is the light doing a job? Is it, is it there for a reason? Is it effective in its, you know, in its job? And too much light becomes ineffective. Light going upward is not doing a job. Light going directly into people's eyes is causing glare and is actually detrimental to the job that's, you know, the safety function of the light. And so, you know, can we target the light better? Can we use minimal light levels, minimum required light levels instead of designing over that? Um, and, uh, you know, can we even deploy controls, presence detection, or, or you know, some sort of switches or, or anything so that, you know, if the light's there, for, for maintenance, then it's only on when maintenance is being done. Uh, you know, things like that to just take light out of the environment, reduce the amount of, total amount of light in the environment. And then of course, like I said, LEDs can be made uh, for any color, of, to emit any color. And the question is, you know, can we, can we leverage that capability to, you know, avoid disturbing certain species? Um, and that's still an open question. Uh, but, but even, you know, aside from the color discussion, all of these other factors or, or techniques, techniques can be deployed to reduce the total amount of light in the environment. All right, next slide. So, you know, we're just, we're just starting with this exploration. Uh, one thing we're gonna do is, is baseline the light levels, like, like Joe was talking about with the, with the sound measurements, acoustics. We need to baseline uh, baseline the situation. So we have some new tools available to take um, highly resolved, very sensitive um, lightscape measurements to determine the le level of light pollution in, in an environment. Um, 
you know, we need to keep working with the animal researchers to understand the, the threshold levels of, of light that you know, cause a disturbance and, and work to uh, design around those levels. And then you know, deploy lighting design modeling and predictive modeling so that we can connect the lighting layout, the, the lighting system with the expected um, impacts it's gonna have in a certain location. And then you know, we need to keep developing tools that have the same level of resolution and sensitivity as the, as the animals <laughs> we're trying to uh, design to. You know, most most um, lighting measurement tools are designed around humans and human needs, uh, but many nocturnal animals, all nocturnal animals have very different sensitivities and are much more sensitive to, the, to light. So we need to um, improve our tool set of sensors and spectrometers to make sure we're we can characterize the, the lighting conditions. And with that, I think I'm done. Uh, next slide, please. Just make sure. All right, questions. Thank you so much, Morgan and Alicia. We appreciate all of you taking the time to share your research with us. As mentioned by our presenters, um, this research for both of these topics was recently published in the Journal of Marine Science and Engineering Special Issue titled Technology and Methods for Environmental Monitoring of Marine Renewable Energy. Links to both of those papers are in the chat. We strongly encourage you to explore that special issue. There's some really great work in there. Um, and now we will open the floor to questions. Um, feel free to post them in the chat. I will start with a question for Morgan and Alicia. For marine energy applications, what species are most important to learn about behavior or physiological response to light and why? It's, it's dependent on the location of the, of the energy device. I think it's... Um, I don't think we have a good answer in general, but it's also dependent on the location. And I was just talking to a evolutionary biologist about this, like what, what kind of de decision tree can we develop to, um, you know, to kind of identify the most impactful species. And of course you wanna, um, you know, you wanna take extra effort with endangered species, but there's, you know, all of these species are connected. So you, so you have to, um, I think we need to have like some sort of decision tree based on location and uh, you know to to design around a specific situation and, th and then of course there are common common species uh, the the plankton that you know we can be be careful about but but yeah we just there's not a clean answer to that yet and Alicia might have, have something to add there. Yeah I think that's a great res response Morgan um, and also yeah, talking to regulators to figure out how we can best, you know, work with the species that are at a at a specific location. Which ones are most important um, based on the regulatory concern for permitting, but then also um, keeping in mind the um, local activities. So, what types of fisheries are there? What are um, so what are important species of fisheries? So, like sturgeon or salmon. Dunge Dungeness crab, um, those are all important species around um, the pack wave site, for instance. And through the permitting of pack wave, um, they looked at everything from the primary producers all the way up to marine mammals and sea turtles. So a lot of data has been collected on these different species. And, and there is a list of, of um, seabirds and, and their importance, but not necessarily in concern for lighting. So that could be, that's kind of why we wanted to discuss this is what, what, are, what might this distribution look like for, or a, a list look like for anthropogenic light in particular. Thank you both. Yeah. Um, I have another anthropogenic light question, and then we'll go back to Joe and um, visit the questions that were asked during his presentation. So this is a question from Ariel. With regards to anthropogenic light pollution, are you planning on looking at either polarization or how illuminescence um, or illuminance varies across the hemisphere of the night sky? Um, we have not looked at polarization yet, and that's a, 
that's an interesting question. I'd, I'd have to defer to a bird expert. Definitely some, some birds have uh, polarized uh, vision that helps with their, um, their hunting, but I'm not sure if those are birds that hunt at night. Uh, and uh, I'd expect that most polarization happens from reflected light off the water. So I'm not sure how much of a nocturnal issue that is, but I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. Um, Definitely right now, when we characterize the lightscape, we do look across the horizon at different uh, angular elevations to see, uh, you know, uh, with regard to where the source, you know, light source might be and uh, atmospheric effects. So we, we are looking at that. Yeah, thanks um, for coming, Levi. I just want to say hi, Levi. And thanks for the question. <laughs> Um, so jumping back to Joe and the underwater noise topic, um, this is a question from Walter. If you use an ADCP during testing, does it have an influence on your recordings? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Walter. Uh, it certainly can. You have to be very uh, careful about where your ADCP is active, right? So um, at the UNH um, experiment, the Living Bridge has an ADCP that is um, using frequencies, I think, above 200 kilohertz, I believe. Um, but the IC uh, frequencies of interest are up to 100 kilohertz. So as long as your ADCP is not operating below 100 kilohertz, then you are not contaminating your passive acoustic data. So, but that is a good question. It's certainly something you need to, <clears throat> you need to pay attention to. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, a question for you from Dave. Um, what accounts for the increased loudness at the far downstream end of your drifts? Dylan had the same question and is wondering if that um, was the vessel noise from retrieving the hydrophone because it seemed to always be at the end regardless of the location of the river. In the river. Yeah, yeah, I think they're referring to the sound pressure level um, circles on the map. Those are probably um sequences you know one second sequences where where the vessel the, the retrieval vessel um you know was was in the recording those sequences aren't used in the metric calculations right so that that map is independent of the actual metrics that we're reporting so um you know in the in the deci decade um calculations there's a step in the iec specification where you you have to basically filter your data Right, so you're looking for times when there is vessel noise, um, and if there is vessel noise in your sequence, you you don't use that in your in your binning. So yes, those are probably related to the vessel uh, recoveries, um, and that's why the ends of those segments were look like they had higher noise levels and were contaminated. Right. Um, another question from James, um, a two-part question. What was the output capacity in watts or kilowatts of that turbine, turbine while you were testing? And how did you determine, A, how far upstream to start the drifts, and B, how many drifts to conduct? Those are both good questions, too, operational speaking. Um, the turbine, I think we got it during those tidal sequences, and we sort of targeted the highest tides of the month in July. but. Um, I think we it, the power rate max power rating we saw was about five kilowatts. Um, for deciding where to put your hydrophone in, that is a tricky question, and it will be site by site based and really comes through trial and error. Um, there were several teams there. There was also a UW team was also using some drifting instrumentation, and we you know it's almost like bowling, right? It's kind of like we, we're lined up and we're, we're putting in our, our hydrophones, looking at the flow, trying to get gauge as best as you can how you put a hydrophone in upstream of a turbine and not have it go right into the turbine, right? So the flow is not constant, steady. It's very turbulent flow. Um, so care was taken to not to make sure we had a vessel that if a instrument looked like it was heading directly for the turbine, you could intercept that. And, and so once we sort of got the flow characteristics figured out at the site, we were able to better align where our drop points were. Um, but it did take several iterations of, of figuring out where that best site was um, to, to put the gear in. And it was, we were putting the hydrophones in probably 50 meters above the measurement zone, just so that they had time to settle 
and stabilize and get to depth prior to our, our, our acoustic measurement. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, question from Zach. Do your findings extend to additional device designs or do you predict a considerable difference in acoustics? Um, that's a good question from Zach. So that I, I think that, you know, this is where we're at in this stage. Turbines are going to sound different until we sort of get the data gaps filled a little bit better. Um, having the power electronics above the water certainly helped in this instance. Um, so I think as many of these um, turbine measurements that we can make and sort of fill a database, we'll get a better feel for what different turbines sound like in different environments. But it's hard to say from just this experiment that, you know, I certainly wouldn't say that this is representative of all the turbine types of, of sound that could be generated. So. Great. And then one last question for you, Joe. Um, how effective was the flow shield? Um, the flow shield is actually a really good design for a drifting system. Um, Brian Pelagi and his UW team have done a lot of work on development on this. They recently did some tests with um, an acoustic Doppler velocimeter and showed that um, they were getting about a 10 to 15 dB difference in the low frequencies um, for flow noise contaminated contamination on an unshielded sensor that was directly next to a shielded sensor. So that design is actually a pretty effective design for a, for a, a floating or a drifting system. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, I know we're over time, but I have one more question back for the anthropogenic light team that was answered in the chat, but in case others are interested, this is a question from Jay. Do you know of any studies examining spectral composition of lights and responses in wild landscapes? Many existing studies identify short wavelength, wavelength minimization for minimizing wildlife impacts, but seabirds have not definitively been shown where they exist on the spectrum. Um, so I think there's two, two questions in there. So, you know, you may have noticed I, I kind of had some comments about Santa Barbara. I, I, I'm in the midst of a separate study, um, uh, measuring sky glow and light pollution off Santa Barbara, look, looking at LA and, and, uh, looking towards from, from the Channel Islands, looking towards, uh, LA and towards, um, Santa Barbara and also catching those squid boats and, and with those measurements, then you get like the aggregate um, uh, light spectrum that's been uh, attenuated, spectrally attenuated over distance. So the, the blue light doesn't travel as far. So you have to account for that. And then, so we're going through some kind of computer techniques to deconvolve the spectrum in the known light source light source spectrum, like a fluorescent light has a certain spectral power distribution and an LED has a certain spectral power distribution, you know, or a range and, you know, high pressure sodium. So the, 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 the objective is to fit those spectral power distributions to what's being measured. Uh, and while also taking into account the, the attenuation, the, the short wavelength attenuation. So that's, that's happening right now. We have plans to take measurements out at the pack wave site to baseline the, um, the lightscape there and go through the same process. Um, and then as far as blue light being more detrimental, um, you know, for seabirds, I, I don't think the, the, what I'm hearing from seabird researchers is that, you know, there's not like a surrogacy, there's not a blue light is preferentially bad for all all species of seabirds. So you can't just make that assumption if you, if you find that in one species. Uh, it doesn't necessarily cross over to a, a, a very closely related species. So I think that the idea that that blue light is extra bad is is up for discussion. And you know, as far as as I'm looking at this right now, generally is is we want to remove light, unnecessary light from the environment, and uh, the light that we do need, we want to make sure it's being effective uh, for its intended function, uh, but but just being the minimum overall, and that. All, all photons are equally uh, detrimental in the ecology, right? Uh, in a certain direction at a certain time uh, until, until we get better, more resolved information. 
Thank you so much, um, all of you, for answering those questions. Thank you for asking these wonderful questions. We want to be respectful of all of the attendees and panelists' time. Um, we have a few closing slides with some resources and upcoming events and things to keep your eye out for. Um, so if you're willing to stay on, we have a few more slides. Um, but thank you. Thank you all again. You can go to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so we, we would love for you to join us on September 1st for our final webinar in our Triton Field Trials series of Triton Talks, where benthic ecologist Lineg Hemery will discuss changes in habitat research, and Alicia Amerson will be back and joined by sustainability engineer Tyler Harris to discuss marine energy sustainability and life cycle assessments. And I will pop the registration link for that in the chat. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Rachel. And our team has also put together a lot of helpful resources to help you stay connected with our work and read about the latest Triton research. These include a monthly newsletter, which I highly su suggest you subscribe to. That's where you get all the latest information. Um, we have a Triton Stories blog, upcoming webinars, and all sorts of other things. You can find all of these in our link tree by scanning the QR code on the slide um, or by visiting the website um, at pnnl.gov slash project slash Triton. We'd also love to hear your feedback and encourage you to take our five-minute survey so we can continue to improve this webinar series. And with that, I will put everything in the chat for you all. Um, with that, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we really appreciate your questions um, and look forward to seeing you at our final webinar in September. Thank you all.